Today on Inside Utah Politics, the race for governor. Who's in? Who's still going to get in? And how will it all play out? Jason Perry, the director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics, is here to break it all down for us. And a rally for equal rights up at the state capitol. Advocates hoping Utah will be the 38th state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Our panel will weigh in on the issue. Time now for Inside Utah Politics. Good Sunday morning and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Glenn Mills. It is time to go inside Utah politics. Now, four Republican candidates have officially launched campaigns to be the next chief executive of our state. They include Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox, Utah County businessman Jeff Birmingham, Salt Lake County Councilwoman Amy Winder Newton, and former Governor and Ambassador John Huntsman Jr. Now, other candidates are still testing the waters as well. Jason Perry, the director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics, is here with some insight on where the race stands and where it will go from here. Jason, yeah. always glad to have you on the show. Thanks so much for being here. Glad to be with you. Okay, so we just saw the four who are officially yeah. in. Let's take that field as it stands and stack up the race. Okay. What are you seeing? Well, this is such an interesting race, and how often do we get this many really great candidates? It's really amazing to see, and it's really been, I don't know, you and I have talked about this in the past, it's been decades since we've had an open seat for governor, mm -hmm. so we can see a lot of people coming forward. Of the candidates right now, really the people who are really polling the best, it's, it's John Huntsman Jr. and Spencer Cox. Names that people know very well, that's helping them. They already have some financing as well. Uh, but these other candidates are, are really trying to make a name for themselves as well. But those are the two right now that seem to be really pulling atop. Okay, and we'll talk about how dynamic uh, could shift yeah. in this race right. in a bit. But let's get into those who are testing the waters or rumored to be in. Yeah. Who could still get into this race? Well, there's a couple that I think are highly likely. We've talked about them in the press. I think Thomas Wright is, is most likely in. Okay. Uh, he's making some of those phone calls. People are really talking to him about getting into this race. He's doing some of the listening tour things that one should do. Highly likely we're going to see him jump in the race. I think Greg Hughes is very likely to do as well. He's raised a lot of money for someone who hasn't announced, mm -hmm. you know, 500,000 already. I think it's safe to say Hughes is definitely in. Yeah, I, I was, I'll was, i go with you on that <laughs> one. Yeah, he's, he's kind of telling some people that's where he is too. So mm -hmm. I think those two are most likely. Okay. The one that we're hearing about that really hasn't really signaled is Rob Bishop. Yeah. Not, he's leaving a seat in Washington, D.C. Amazingly silent. And maybe the silence is what's telling us the most. Any, any thoughts on what he's weighing or what could or could not get him yeah. into the race? I, I think he's spending time just really wrapping up his time in Washington, D.C. There will be a moment, and he keeps telling people out in the world, he said, uh, really, the right time to announce if, if I'm going to is in January. Mm -hmm. So he wants to do it right before the session starts if he's going to do it. It's interesting because he's, of all the candidates we've just mentioned, he's the one that's saying the least publicly about his intentions. But he can also uh, do that because he has name ID. He, he does. And really, if you want to be successful in this race, it, it's such an advantage to have name ID mm -hmm. and to have money. And the people who are up front right now are there, and he's got both of those really ready to yeah. go. Uh, uh, he's great at raising funds, has proven so in the past. Let's talk, okay, so let's take the first two, Thomas Wright yeah. and Greg Hughes. If those two are in, how does that shift the dynamic of this race? Well, it becomes a race of really of two key efforts. All the all the candidates who are in right now that we know for sure are really not too far away from each other on the political spectrum. So they're going to cannibalize each other a lot right there. And that's more of the conservative? That is that is more of the, 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 the moderates. I mean. okay. Yeah, more of the moderates right there. And if you get Hughes mm -hmm. and Wright to jump in, which I think they will, this really pulls uh, the supporters from the, from, the, from the right end of the spectrum. Uh, they both have a lot of really of Republican credentials. They've been involved with them for a long time. And those two are really going to take the far right. See, and I was kind of thinking Jeff Birmingham might, might jump into that uh, lane as well. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I Because I'm hearing from a lot of people who tend to be on the more conservative side that they're liking him. Well, I think that they are. And I think for him, he needs to start skewing more to the right. He identifies very well with the business community, the venture capital community, and he's making a lot of you know, effort to really to reach out to those groups. So I think the moderates, he, that, that's kind of a sweet spot for him, but he will skew for the right. And this creates this plurality issue, which is just going to be yeah. the thing I wanted, to watch. I wanted to get into you there. Uh, l let's take a look at one other thing, though. So you have Thomas Wright and Jeff mm -hmm. Burningham in the business sector. That's kind of where they're coming up. The rest of them have political office. How does that 
potentially weigh on voters' minds? Well, uh, it's interesting because a lot of these candidates have true records to run on, mm -hmm. all right? And that's why you see some of them have negatives already. You say they're popular in one, one group and they're negative in another. It's because we've known them for a long time. The people who love them, love them. The ones that don't, don't seem to forget. So that has an impact on the candidates that we know very well. Newcomers like him have opportunity, not just now, but maybe for a race in the future. Run a good race, build the name ID, really kind of live to fight another day, maybe even take advantage of this plurality issue mm -hmm. and maybe even do better than we think. Okay, let's get into that more. When you take a look at the Salt Lake City mayoral race, mm -hmm. we saw plurality have an impact on that and change the dynamic. Could we potentially see that in this governor's race as well? I think we're going to see that, particularly when you have so many moderate candidates. Uh, they will have an impact on each other, but really, if they cannibalize each other, you start getting small percentage of, of voters who are supporting them. And then you see the far right, and you could see someone like a Thomas Wright, for example, 25, 30 percent of the vote mm -hmm. ends up being the winner because that's the one person that can get the most. The other candidates are going to have to guard against that. But there's one thing that not many people are talking about that I think is so interesting is how many people will affiliate as Republicans for that primary? That's a very good point. Uh, what do you think is going to happen there? I think a lot of people will. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the reality of it. You know, we talk about there being a lot of Republicans in Utah, and there are, but there's an enormous number of independents uh, that go both, go both ways, depending right. on the candidate, but they will and can affiliate with the Republican Party and vote in that, in that, uh, in that election. Mm -hmm. And I think there will be enough of them that it will have an impact, and it will bring from people from all, the sides of, all sides of the spectrum. Because if you look at it, it's been how many decades now since a Democrat has won statewide office. So people probably look at that and say, that's the election my, yeah. vo my voice will make more of a difference in. Yeah, that's a very interesting well, even, concept. There. Even Democrats, I mean, that's the thing. We right. will see some Democrats affiliate as Republicans to vote in that primary, mm -hmm. particularly if they identify with one of these candidates. Are we gonna see all of the candidates go both convention and signature out? I think every single one of them will. You know, when, when they ask me, uh, when they do, I'll tell you, I think it's just malpractice not to do that. Mm -hmm. The law al allows you to do both, and I think someone should, but you know, the second question comes, should you ever skip the convention? I don't think anyone should do that. Yeah. I think everyone should spend time doing both the tracks. Okay. Okay, uh, let's talk about timing. This primary is gonna come up right in the middle of summer mm -hmm. on June 30th, middle of family vacations, you know, break from school. What impact might that have on this race? Mm -hmm. It's gonna have an impact on turnout for sure. In the last election, we had about 53% of the registered Republicans uh, showed up to vote. Um, I'm, I'm hoping we hit that again. But those summer months are just really hard to get people engaged in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we still have a chance to vote by mail. My hope is that people still turn out. But this is an important enough race. And if you think people are going to see enough of these candidates that it'll be top of mind, I think they'll show up. And we have certainly seen vote by mail make a huge impact on our on our turnout, yeah. no doubt about that. I want to bring up another thing that maybe we haven't talked about much, and you, you mentioned the field. We are seeing a lot of friends pinned against yeah. each other here, not only candidates, but their staff. What do you make of that? <laughs> I mean, one, one great example is Governor Herbert endorsing Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox in this. All of a sudden, former governor, who Herbert was the lieutenant governor yeah. for, jumps in the race. Are we making some awkward moments here? Well, there are a lot of people that are mostly just giving out big checks now. So I have so many friends in the race, the only mm -hmm. thing I can do is really give money to everyone. <laughs> That's happening for a few folks, but it mm -hmm. does become a little bit awkward. Uh, with, with our own uh, Governor Herbert, as you know, he, he's been on opposite sides of Governor Huntsman and, to, and who he is supporting mm -hmm. in the past. Like for example, you know, uh, Romney, when he was running for president versus John Huntsman, who was supporting John McCain. They're used to picking different sides. They're still going to be friends, but a lot of people are in a very precarious position right now when they got to choose between their friends. Yeah, and I get that, you know, when you, when you uh, talk about it in open, you're still going to be friends, but behind scenes, is there some animosity there? Well, it's going to get more difficult <laughs> as we get closer. Right now, everyone's kind of friends, and we're trying mm -hmm. to see who jumps in, but once the, the field narrows a bit, and mm -hmm. the polling starts to show who's on top and who's thinking they should be, it's going to get a little more nasty, and right. those tensions are going to really start to okay. go high. Boy, it's going to be a fascinating race, no doubt about that. Appreciate your insight. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Glad to be with you. Still to come, Democrats on the House Intel Committee released their draft impeachment report. Our panel debates what it means and where the process goes from here. But first, the highest court in the land taking up a new, a new York gun law. How the case could set a new standard for the country.
Anti-gun violence groups and gun rights supporters rallying on the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court during the week as the justices heard arguments on a New York City gun law. The case involves a city ordinance that regulated the transport of guns outside gun owners' homes. Activists have continued to push the issue, hoping for a landmark ruling. Washington correspondent Morgan Wright has reaction. Enough is! From the steps of the Supreme Court, gun safety advocates and lawmakers defended local gun regulations. We have a right to protect ourselves and our communities. This is what a movement looks like, right? Connecticut Democratic Senator Chris Murphy argues the case has major implications. They want to take our right away to make change, to pass laws that actually make our streets safer. The court must rule on whether a New York City ordinance restricting how gun owners could transport outside their homes violates the Second Amendment. Even though the city repealed the ordinance, gun rights advocates pushed the case all the way to the Supreme Court. Now gun safety advocates at the Brady campaign say state and city level gun regulations all over the country are at risk of being struck down. Things like background checks, extreme risk laws that have now been acted in 17 states and the District of Columbia, and indeed an assault weapons ban can be upheld. This marks the first major Second Amendment case to go before the high court in nearly a decade. Paul Clement argued the case on behalf of the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. This is part and parcel of the kind of regulations that have no basis in text, history, or tradition and should not be upheld consistent with the Second Amendment. An opinion in this case is expected before the end of the court's term in June. Reporting in Washington, Morgan Wright. Service member housing is under investigation in Congress with top brass from the Army, Navy, and Air Force brought in for answers to crumbling conditions on military bases. Washington correspondent Kelly Meyer caught up with frustrated residents. A lot of families feel like they're not being heard and that nobody cares. Military families filled a Senate hearing room Tuesday, joining livid lawmakers upset by living conditions on military bases across the country. Families facing mold, rats, roaches, and basic appliance issues. I serve in the Navy, and you expect that the when you're in the military that your housing is going to be something you want to live in. Florida Senator Rick Scott questioned the panel of military officials from the Army, Navy, and Air Force on the fastest way to correct the problem. I asked Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy after the hearing if anyone will be held accountable. We're putting mechanisms in place so that we can hold folks accountable. Some senators pointed to delayed government funding as a potential cause to the military's housing problems. Alabama Senator Doug Jones says the passage of the looming National Defense Authorization Act is a necessary first step. Uh, that is going to provide a mechanism for, I think, each branch to really do the kind of job that they need to do to get the homeowners and get their military people in a good shape. Both Democrats and Republicans on the committee want a vote on the NDAA ASAP, but couldn't say when it will happen. And as for an immediate fix for military families and their homes, some inside this hearing room will be spending the holidays in hotels, holding out hope for a solution. Reporting in Washington, I'm Kelly Meyer. Coming up, a state lawmaker announces a resolution to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. We'll take a closer look at the issue with our panel after the break. Time now for a closer look at the big stories of the week with the Inside Utah Politics panel. This week we have State Representative Carol Spackman Moss and former Speaker of the House Greg Hughes. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate thank having you. both of you. We may have been talking about you a little earlier in the show, uh -oh. by the way. Yeah, my nose was itchy. <laughs> that's why. Okay, I get it. I All thought right. it was allergies. Yeah, right. no, nope, that's okay. not it. Okay, let's get right to it. Equal Rights Amendment. Big rally at the state capitol on Tuesday. Representative, you were there. I was uh, there. What was the atmosphere like and what's your pitch for making that go through? Well, the speeches were powerful. The audience was uh, so excited. It was a mixture of all ages, women and men and little kids. And uh, the speakers made powerful points. One of the best speakers besides 
Christine Durham, former Chief Justice, Representative Karen Kwan was a high school student from Park City. She just wowed him. She'd done her research. But this is not the 70s. That's the big thing to remember. All the fears should be of the 70s should be gone. This so is 2019. Mm -hmm. You would like to see the state move forward, become the yes. 38th state to ratify. It'd be wonderful if that happened. All right, former speaker, your thoughts? I, look, I agree with the sentiment clearly. My mother is a single mother. She raised us as a single mom in the 70s, and my grandmother was a single mother. Uh, the th this is what I'm worried about with the, with the partisan we see partisanship we see in politics right now. There are some legal scholars, even uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's argued that potentially you would have to start over, that, that, that there was a time limit and you would need to get states to re, uh, re-vote this issue. I don't want to create a climate where we speak past one another. I think that the goal of making sure that we treat everyone the same or equally is absolutely, uh, it's, it's a no-brainer today. I think our state constitution articulates it wonderfully, better than our U.S. Constitution does. I would probably be more interested in legislation that makes sure or ensures that women are treated uh, fairly in the workplace, and if there's a problem with that, I'd like to get more prescriptive. Mm. But they're not Address here that. in Utah. I mean, we have the biggest disparity in wages and, and gender of, of probably any state. I mean, Utah's way down there, and women work in Utah in high numbers. And it's time we address that, but it's not just that. It's the whole idea, and it's just a, a premise that maybe they'd have to start over. That's not an absolute. We just need one more state, and it'll be done. You do make the mention that our Constitution already has this protection Correct. in it. However, as she points out, we do have the largest wage gap here in, this, in the country as well. So how do you combine those two? So I, I think that our culture, different, there's different cultures. I think you have, uh, in, in some cases, uh, women who uh, are in the workforce, maybe leave the workforce, raise a family, come back into the workforce on a more frequent basis than men would. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's, but I think that would statistically change someone's career path or career earnings. But I will tell you this, I fundamentally believe that if, and I believe that there are issues that we need to make sure that we're very sensitive of maternity leave or, or if you have children, being able to be able to be there when you have a child, being able to get back into the workplace. But I would far, as a former lawmaker, I would far rather be prescriptive about that than the ERA issue that uh, until recently, I didn't know that it was still alive and well or being looked at in terms of being passed. Uh, it might be symbolic, but I would rather see political sp capital spent on something more specific that it would be impactful. And then what I really don't want to see is what I feel like we're even doing now, arguing uh, about the logistics or the technical aspects of it that would leave someone with the impression that you don't want uh, equal rights for everyone, men and women together. And so. I just don't want another reason to be divided. Okay, let's go into one more thing real quick on this. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a huge opponent back then, still today. Uh, a lot of that revolves around the abortion issue. Your thoughts there? Um, those are unfounded in my view, and not just my view, but um, people in the legal um, profession. And um, Chief Justice Durham has not express that concern at all. I, I mean, this is not the 70s, and none of those things would happen, and they haven't happened. And, and I just think they're old tropes, and we shouldn't be dredging those up again. Let's look at today, women in the workforce. I've spent my entire adult life in the workforce, raised a family, and um, it's, it's a necessity for most families today. Any thoughts on the religious aspect of it? Yeah, look, this is, this is where I think the art of, Carol's been a lawmaker, longer than I, uh, I was. You were there when I arrived, mm -hmm. you're there mm -hmm. after I've left. I know that you can hear and I know that I developed the ability to hear common ground when people are speaking about the same things. What we're talking about right now, whether there's a legal argument about how it would impact states' uh, rights and how they would uh, create a legal structure for abortion or not, I just don't wanna keep having legal arguments over something that is intuitively and something that we would hear, there's common ground. I would rather spend that political capital on areas that we agree, because I don't think this is a, a point of disagreement. I think we're just gonna get down in the deep grass and argue some of these legal finer points that you can't really, dis you can't conclude until you get to the highest court and hear a determination. And why? And spend we're already see, we're starting to see abortion go that route anyway, getting up to the mm -hmm. Supreme Court with different states right, making different right. moves. Let's move on to the impeachment process. Uh, we saw during the week the, the Democrats on the House Intel com uh, Committee 
uh, releasing their report, basically stating that Trump plays personal and political interests above the U.S. Your thoughts on the report that we saw coming from Chairman Schiff? I think that the public hearings that were finally made available to the public and a, a greater transparency in those hearings uh, coincided with polls that showed people were not uh, as confident in this process. And the and I think the reason why is I don't I think that the charges are spurious. I don't think there's anyone that testified in these public hearings that had any direct knowledge of the president demanding uh, quid pro quo or whatever they're describing it as. Uh, Speaker Pelosi said a while ago that she would expect an impeachment process that would be bipartisan. And that certainly has been the case in the serious impeachment processes in the 1860s and the 70s with President Nixon and in the 90s with President Clinton. You don't have that here. You have a very partisan process, and I think that it uh, doesn't rise to that level. And I can tell you, as a, uh, going back to our time as legislators, we would not exclude the minority party from an impeachment process, uh, an initial vote to begin those processes. We would look for open hearings. The way we would conduct ourselves as a state legislature with that broad power of impeachment, I think we, would look very, very different than what you're seeing in Washington right now. Representative. Well, I don't think the facts are in dispute. I mean, the president has acknowledged them, and so have his closest aides, Mitt Mulvaney and others say, hey, so it was a quid pro quo, what of it? What does it matter? Everybody does it. I mean, he did ask for help. He asked for help for political purposes and interfering in, uh, in money that had been uh, authorized by Congress, and it, it was a bribery for political purposes he interfered with a, a foreign government. He asked them to interfere in our election. So I don't think the facts are in dispute, but as far as being bipartisan, I think that just reflects the way the country is right now. I wanted to talk about that because if we take a look at where this is going, it's uh, likely the House is gonna move forward with their vote, uh, move on to the Senate where it's likely not to get the vote there. What is this doing to the country when we see this pro uh, process play out? I, look, it's, it's to what Carol just said. I think the facts are absolutely in dispute. I think that you, that I've read the transcript. I think that he mentioned the corruption and the concern he had with it, that you, the, the president of Ukraine said he didn't feel that he was being pressured. The money did, was received. So even the fact that two people and friends but, can mm -hmm. hear the <laughs> same exact that's information what I wanna, that's what I and talk come about. up with mm -hmm. completely different there's a complete, conclusions. There's a complete divide. It's a worry. You kind of take a look at this and you wonder if you're watching two, two separate mm -hmm. uh, processes it's, play out. It's, it's so a, what impact is that having on the country? A, a, a negative one. I, 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 I'm telling you that even it's even impacting my children now. My youngest one uh, watches this and I can, I can sense that he is scared, he, that he feels hopeless about whether the world's gonna end in 12 years or whether uh, who's right in which station. My son, he's 16 and he came up with this great idea. He said, Dad, what if you had a news station that wasn't just uh, CNN or MSNBC and liberal or Fox and conservative and they just shared the news. Well, we're sitting and he on thought one that right that now. Was I know. Novel, he <laughs> thought ABC, that's a novel NBC, idea. NBC, CBS. Think, think well, you can stop after people. ABC. <laughs> Look, think about our young people and what they're Mainstream watching right now. Mainstream right. media. It's different. And I am going to tell you that that climate does not exist when you get down to okay. the state level. Okay. All right, I have to give you some time You've got to give me some time. Yes. time. <clears throat> okay. The, the norms of the presidency have been so altered by this president that we don't, it, it, we, we just can't even imagine the things that will happen day to day. So the Republicans in Congress have absolutely been co-opted because of their fear of, in, of the president intimidates them to the point where they go along with it. If we allow this to happen, this continual erosion of constitutional norms, the House of Representatives is supposed to do impeachment hearings if they think there's been an impeachable offense. And then the executive branch just stonewalls said, hey, we won't answer subpoenas, we won't send witnesses. So th this is a process that is, is so important to the future of this country constitutionally. Okay. We are gonna have to end it on that note, unfortunately. 10 minutes goes by just like that. Great to have both of you on the show. Thanks Thank for being you. here, appreciate Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Stay Great with us, we'll be right with back uh, with more Inside Utah <laughs> Politics right after the break.
We leave you now with a look at what's on the radar in the world of politics. The general legislative session begins next month. The 45 day session opens on Monday, January 27th. Utah also participating in Super Tuesday for the uh, the uh, presidential primary that is set for Tuesday, March 3rd, then caucus night for both Utah Republicans and Democrats is Tuesday, March 24th. Make sure to connect with me on social media. I'd like to know what you think of this show and other issues important to you. You can email me at insideutahpolitics at abc4.com. You can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Just log on and search Glenn Mills ABC4. Thanks so much for making us part of your Sunday morning. We hope to see you again next week as we go Inside Utah Politics.